hearing a little bit more in depth about uh, what kind of what John was speaking on with the consumer uh, attitudes and uh, the housing market. So, uh, you know, we've heard about this for years, right? The how we have so many seniors coming into the market, and lately we've heard a lot about um, just the whole housing market piece. And I want to start out by sharing my personal story with you. This is uh, my former house, I'm still living there, but my former house. We bought this in 2018. It's about 3,000 square feet, and it's located in Plano, Texas, not far from here, which is uh, a very desirable um, town. A lot of people are moving to this area, and the community that I live in is also just a, a lovely community. We, um, the house had had some renovations when we bought it, and, uh, and I think it's a lovely house. Um, we did a, did a good job of trying to take care of it, make sure that if it needed anything, we were on it. In 2019, we decided um, that our backyard and pool needed a little bit of updating, so we put about $20,000 into the backyard uh, in the pool area just to make it what we wanted because we were living there and wanted this nice area to enjoy. And then after spending too much time at home in 2020 with the pandemic, I, like a lot of other people, decided that my kitchen and bathroom were just not adequate. So. Uh, much to my husband's dismay, I said, now's the time to, to upgrade the kitchen and the bathroom. So we invested about $80,000 into some renovations, and we we did a lot. I know there's not a before picture here, and I don't know if I should have put that on here, but we added a window, we totally rearranged the kitchen, new appliances, new all new cabinetry for both the bathroom and the kitchen. Um, you can't see it in this picture, but there's just an absolutely wonderful walk-in shower back there that was a real showstopper when we uh, decided to sell our home back in April. So what happened for us in this process, you know, it's a seller's market, we're told. We didn't really even know what that meant, right? You know, we're like, okay, we're going to get a good price for our house. We put our house up for sale uh, or started showing on a Saturday morning. We had 54 showings between Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon, and um, our realtor brought us just the best four offers. We had multiple offers, but he brought just the best four offers for us. And we ended up selling the home for twice what we paid for it just in 2018 and for $80,000 over asking price. We were stunned. I'm sharing that with you not to brag about my own situation, but to let you know that we ha I had no idea what it meant when people were saying it's a seller's market. And I'm going to guess that a large number of our seniors don't know that either. They don't get what that means and how much that can mean for them in terms of uh, wealth, investment, and so forth. So, And maybe you do or do not know that about your own house or your own market. So as I'm sharing this with you, I'm, I'm also going to challenge you to go back to your markets and find out what that means in your market. So um, I sh uh, pulled a slide together that has a couple of markets. Some of you are in these markets here in this room. Over the past 12 months, these are the price increases in these markets. I mean, they're huge. They're huge price increases. In addition to that, um, the other thing that has been happening is that the number of days on market has been very low in these, uh, that the house has been on the market has been very low. In New York, which is a little more complicated to sell a house in New York, 39 days on market. In Spokane, 27. Kansas City, 13 days on market. Tampa, 7 days. And Atlanta, 12 days. So, I mean, that's how fast someone is putting a sign in their yard and it's being sold. In addition to that, in these markets, more than 50% of the homes are sold above asking price. And this information comes from John Burns' uh, real estate consulting site, and it's um, updated as of May of 2022. So this is current information that you're looking at here. And I, I'm not sure that if you haven't have been looking at this or have not been looking at this, that you really understand this for yourself, for your market. And this, you know, we're constantly trying to educate our sales teams on keep up with what's going on in your market because it's important. And it becomes important conversations with our seniors as well. The home, so even though it is a strong seller's market, the home is still our number one competitor, right? Seniors want to stay in their homes. John talked about this. They don't want to leave. They want to bring care in. Um, and they think it's going to be the cheaper 
less expensive um, piece for them? Well, reality is, is it may not be. Um, and in most cases, it ends up not being because the longer you stay in your home, the more it costs you, right? The, um, you have unexpected expenses. Property taxes year over year are increasing. Home insurance is increasing as well. Um, my property taxes on my home increased from 2018 to 2022, 40%, which is a pretty big increase. But again, Plano's becoming a very desirable um, location or is a very desirable location. But if one chooses to age in place, there are a lot of things that they may not be considering on the front end that it's our job to help them understand from the sales and marketing side. If health declines, there may be um, some accommodations that you need to make in the house, such as adding a ramp, widening doors, making uh, changes to the countertops that's under the sinks, those kinds of things. Again, I talked about the unexpected um, costs as well. So, it, you know, it is our job to make sure that we're educating, uh, and that's always been the case, because as Mark said, nobody wakes up in the morning. I've never heard a salesperson tell me, Someone came in my office today and said they woke up and this was the day they're going to buy senior living. I've never heard anyone say that. So, you know, our job is to help them understand this. In addition to what has always been a, a difficult, challenging sale because of the emotions around it and staying in their home, and some of them are coming to us with 50 years in their home, right? And they, they are very attached to the memories there, or they just can't fathom the thought of going through the process of downsizing and right-sizing and, and so forth. But in addition to all of that, we are now selling into the headwinds of so many more messages, right? Our seniors are already skittish from the pandemic and everything that occurred there. Now we've got many, many more messages that we're dealing with. There's so much chatter out there about all of these things. How many of you have had a conversation since you've been here about gas prices or food prices? I, it's everywhere, right? We're having those conversations, whether how it's affecting you personally or how it's affecting uh, the impact it's having on your community. So, you know, I'm not going to get into these because, you know, John spent some time talking about all this, but one of the things that we are hearing more of now or that I, my personal experience with my teams is capital gains tax. It's, people have always been concerned about that. However, with what they're feeling like is the loss in their investments, and then they're going to get hit with capital gains tax, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So we, again, I'm going to go back to making sure that you are educating and working with your teams, and we are educating and working with your teams to, so that they can confidently talk about all this. So, you know, with all of this, what does it mean? for us from the sales and marketing side. Well, it means that our job is to quiet the noise, is to help them feel confident about what's going on and that senior living is still a very good uh, choice for them to make. It always has been a great choice. You know, if you can put your shoes, put yourself in the shoes of the seniors, you know, John was talking about this. It, it's, it's not a linear decision. It's not black and white. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. It is an emotional decision that they're making. And we have to back that up with the facts that help them feel good about that decision. And if you can put yourself in their shoes and think about all the messages that are coming at them, coming at us right now, and we're kind of stuck with, what does this mean? What do I do next? Think of how they feel. You know, they are, as John mentioned, they're no longer working and gaining income in most cases. You know, their, their income has stopped other than maybe earnings on investments and things like that. I am still working. This affects me. It stinks. But I know I'm still bringing income in. They're looking at a different story with that. Um, in addition to, you know, everything else, don't forget that there's a war out there. And that makes seniors very uneasy. So on top of everything else... You know, that's always looming out there, too, and they're hearing about this from the time they get up in the morning, uh, you know, on the, on the morning news. Just the other day, I heard on the Today Show, and I, I just about fell over. They had a 73-year-old woman on there, and they were interviewing her about her concerns over cost increases. And, and she said, I think I'm going to have to go back to work. You know, I retired, thought I had this much money, but I'm scared about what's going on with, you know, the pricing and everything. 
And I was like, oh, please don't let anybody have heard that because, you know, that's not what we want them coming into our communities with that message in their mind, right? Um, we also need to let them know, remind them that we've been successful in times past. We have thrived through some of these things. There was the, the housing crash of 08 and 09, but look at us now. You know, these things will pass. These are just temporary moments in time. They're, it's a glitch. It's a real concern. Certainly, we don't want to downplay the concern, but we're going to be okay. We're going to get through this, and it, everything is going to be okay. And in a lot of cases, likely their net worth has even increased if they're in a home that has increased in value the way my home has increased. There are a lot of other hidden services and amenities that we maybe don't sell as well as we should in the community. And so uh, I know I've been working with my teams to really talk about that. John talked about the me, what's in it for me. And this is where that kind of comes in. How is this going to benefit you? How are, how are things going to be better for you? Not care related, but how are things going to be better for you? One of the things that I think we really need to be sharing right now is the convenience and certainty service. If you're in your home right now and your refrigerator breaks and you pick up the phone to call someone, it might be two, three, four days a week before someone gets there because there are staffing shortages everywhere, right? It's not just in our senior living communities. So even when the person comes and they look at your refrigerator, oh, the part that we need for that is going to take two weeks to get because there are still supply chain issues. Well, there's a convenience and certainty of moving into our communities that takes all of that away, it takes the hassle factor away. And we don't talk about that enough and how it can benefit them. And so, you know, talk to your, your teams about that. You know, what are the things that, that we can really promote that talks about what they're going to be experiencing and how life can be better for them in our communities? Um, and you may need to be the expert on some of those things as well. So make sure that you are spending that time with your sales team. I mean, I'm really going to challenge y'all with that. Oftentimes, you know, everybody kind of gets in their silos of what their jobs are. But our sales teams need your support to sometimes provide the information and provide the expertise that a senior wants to, to see and feel as well. Um, care needs. We talked about, John talked a little bit about care needs. You know, there are issues in the, in the world right now on staffing shortages, you're experiencing a shortage of maybe CNAs or nurses or whatever in your healthcare area. Home health companies are experiencing the same thing. Uh, they may say, I'm going to stay in my home and I'll bring care in. There's no guarantee that care is going to be available. You know, th these organizations are, you know, at their maximum as well. Mark shared a story with me uh, when we were talking about this, about his own parents using home health and whoever was supposed to show up, the caregiver that was supposed to show up, was not available. I don't know if she called in sick or quit or what, you know, whatever the situation may be. The owner of the company had to come to Mark's parents' house to fill in that time. Now, maybe that particular owner was qualified to do so for whatever the needs were, but there are a lot of people who are not qualified to do that. And so those are the types of things that you, we need to be sharing and making sure that they understand as well. Those types of concerns will not occur in your community, and we need to continue to, to talk about that. And then there are a lot of other um, services and amenities that we do talk about, but maybe now's the time to really be talking about that a little bit more and the conveniences that it will provide to their life. Choice and control, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because John um, certainly did a great job talking about that, but seniors are looking for more choice and control right now. And... Uh, we need to be making sure that we're looking at, we're being creative, and how can we do that? I know that when you, we pr start providing those types of things, costs go up, and that's okay. We, we just need to be transparent with people. We need to help our sales teams be able to talk through why the cost is increasing. We need to be making sure that our residents understand that as well, so that there's not a lot of, you know, grumbling going on among the residents that gets outside of the community. And, and these are, by and large, you know, well-educated people who've worked for a living, they know what you're facing from a business perspective. And, you know, being transparent about those types of things can be very helpful in, in overcoming them. Uh, 
so I want you to walk away with some things that you can do uh, with this. Don't get stuck in how you do business. We do need to be looking at changing. You know, invest in your team in ongoing sales training. Mary Jane and Trisha are going to, you know, talk about that more, more for, on the sales side. But, you know, there's also training that can be done in your community by a sales regional or um, we work a lot with our management group on how to train other positions as well. You know, we can do training with concierge. We can do training with your housekeeping staff, your whoever. Uh, they're all a part of the sales process, right? Everyone's a salesperson. And so maybe they should be receiving sales training as well. And we can work with you on that to do that. I would venture to say that all of my uh, co-regionals in the sales and marketing arena love to do present they love to do training. So we would be happy to help with that. Get creative in how we're supporting prospects as they're making this decision. Who are the experts in your area that you can rely on? Who are the realtors, the appraisers? You know, when it comes to a lot of the questions around um, the housing market right now? Who are some financial advisors that you can partner with that can understand your contracts and understand your community and help share that? You know, whether it's they come in and they do a presentation or whether it's something that uh, you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that person. Not everybody wants to come to a presentation, so if you have a financial advisor that you can link up with. The other thing is, what are you an expert about? What expertise can you provide for your team? You know, maybe you're a CFO that has a lot of knowledge about what's going on in the market right now and you keep up with that, that's something you track. Offer yourself to your sales team to be able to help have those conversations. We have a great group of resources here at Greystone, our, our Plan Fin group, our management group. They, they all can have those conversations and have had those conversations in several of the communities that I work with when we need to have someone who's not a salesperson that has that expertise that can talk that language um, and it sounds much more intelligent than coming from me. So, you know, we've had those conversations. So think about that. John talked about alternate contracts. You know, most of us have maybe one, two or three contracts and we, there's one that we push really hard. Now's the time to be considering different things. And again, our um, Jim Knox our, and our planning and finance group have done a great job of putting some contracts together that are working great in the communities. So, you know, feel free to ask those questions here while you're here. What are some other contracts that we should consider? What are some of the things that you're doing? Um, pricing, entry fee, monthly service fee needs to increase. We know that. We get it. Maybe we need to look at the incentives we're offering so that it still can be competitive in your market and they're still very interested. Most important, importantly, instead of saying, no, we can't do that, that's not how we've done that, find a way to say yes. Let your first thoughts be, how could we do that? When someone comes to you and says, this is the objection I'm hearing, this is what I, I'm having trouble overcoming, how can we do that? It doesn't have to be, you know, we, we've always wanted it to be cookie cutter because that makes it easy but maybe it doesn't need to be so cookie cutter because what I want in a community could be very different from what Christy wants. And so maybe we need to start thinking a little more about what it can look like. And I don't mean to make it sound like it's easy. I know it's not. I know that's not easy. But what I also know is that for those of you sitting in this room, you just went through a couple of really hard years where you had to pivot quickly and make some quick changes because of the pandemic and how it was affecting your community. And whether you did it on your own or you worked with our management group, we made some quick changes. And it was changes that sometimes were shocking at first, but they had to be done quickly. Either way, our residents came out great and are happy and you did it. So we know that we can do it again, whatever we're facing, right? We know that we can do it. So find a way to say yes um, and so that you can do that. So before I hand it over to Christy, um, I shared at the beginning that I, you know, have just sold my house, and I've sold my house because I'm going to be moving to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and this is my reason why. What I'm most excited about, though, is that I get to share this picture because I spoke before Stuart, and I said, if I ever speak before Stuart Jackson, I'm going to show pictures of my family because Stuart always does, in some way, show a picture of his family or tell a story about his family, and I thought, 
by golly, I get to talk before Stuart, so I'm going to put pictures of my grandkids in there. So this is my reason for moving to Tulsa, and I can't wait to get there. Well, so staying on theme, um, I'll stick with it. These are my kids. Um, this is Aiden and Avery. Uh, this is actually an older picture. My son's now um, several inches taller than me. Um, but I have a point here. So this is summertime in Texas. And I think you're all experiencing summertime in Texas. It's about 127 degrees outside. And so good activity for us to take the kids is to go to the water park. And there's a favorite slide of my son's at the water park that he, he always has to do. My daughter's like, well, maybe a little smarter than him. I'm not sure. Um, but you go to the slide, and you walk up four to five flights of stairs. You get up to the top, and you step out onto the platform. You cross your arms over your chest, or you plug your nose. Maybe you pray. I'm not sure. You wait a minute, because what happens next is the floor actually drops out from underneath you, and you drop four or five levels down this water slide. And I wonder, in this current economic environment that we're all facing, how many of us have kind of been feeling like that, either personally or professionally, or how many of our residents um, or prospective residents feel like that right now? We've kind of been up in this hyperinflationary environment, and everyone's just kind of wondering what's coming up next. So, and it's reasonable. We all have angst about this right now. Um, there's a lot of pressure points that we <laughs> talked about today. The economy's facing a lot of headwinds. Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation in the news about what all is going on. Um, and as Mark mentioned this morning, I don't have a crystal ball, and you certainly don't want to hear me try to give some type of perspective on GDP or fiscal policy or um, what I think about any great epiphanies about any of that. But I'd like to focus for a minute on the senior housing market and some of the positives that we're still seeing there in the strong basic market fundamentals that we see for our senior housing market. The first is this, and it wouldn't be a Greystone event if we didn't go ahead and put the baby boomer slide up here and talk about the demographics, because the demographics are robust. And um, you know, in case you haven't been to the Greystone offices, we all have this picture framed in our offices. We keep our eye on it. Um, but we've overshared this chart a little bit, so I thought I'd show this in a different, different manner for you today. Um, this is a chart, again, from John Burns Real Estate Consulting, and um, Terry mentioned that she had a slide from there as well. They um, provide a wealth of analysis on housing industry, um, both for the United States, and then they also focus on about 50 sub-markets that they provide a lot of detail on. And so, Greystone, we like to look at all of this information as we're looking at markets and um, looking at planning projects and to really understand what's going on. So this chart reflects the number of individuals hitting the retirement age um, of 65 each year. And um, you can see this spans over um, starting at 1980, so the past 40 years. And the scale shown is in millions of individuals. So you can see here the U.S. hovered around 2 million individuals hitting 65 um, for a long time. Went through the early 2000s, and then in 2012, they had what um, John Burns calls a retirement population explosion. I um, don't know how that word sounds with it, but explosion. You can see the big jump in 2012, and that's when um, that group, if you think about that, that was 10 years ago. Those individuals are now turning 75 this year. Terry, 75 is a good age. So um, for us, 75 is a good age. So that, that population explosion is good for our communities. Um, and then certainly you can see then um, after that um, going higher than 3.5 million per year and now even up into 4 million per year hitting that retirement age. Um, and so this is, this, is, this is the reason there's a dramatic increase in the number of seniors in your market, and it's growing at a dramatic pace. And Mark shared this chart um, earlier, and so I have a little bit of um, additional detail to provide you here, but um, this is, um, you know, we look at senior income levels when determining monthly fees, and this um, particular information, we looked at 2016 projections as of 2021, so that we compare what the five-year projections were for 2021 with what actually um, we were experiencing in 2021. And this is the actual number of senior households age 75 and older in each of these income brackets. And again, as, as Mark mentioned, you'll see that for seniors age 75 and older uh, in, in the 75,000 income level and higher, and in the 100,000 income level and higher even, we were seeing that the projections were actually 
30% lower than what we actually experience. So what does that mean? Um, we just wanted to kind of put that in some perspective for us. So we looked at that in terms of the total number of additional seniors in that income bracket compared to what was projected. And so we found that that meant there were 726,000 seniors in that income bracket at the 75,000 income level more than what was projected. So if you assumed only 10% of those seniors moved into a CCRC, that'd be an additional 240 additional communities that could be supported in the United States. So that's dramatic. Additionally, then, we looked at what this means in terms of the projected annual growth um, at those various income levels. And so um, when you see what you've got the income qualifiers here, um, roughly uh, doubled in each of these income brackets um, once you um, looked at what was the actual experience and growth compared to what was projected. And so just to look at income from another source, um, this is the John Burns data. This is median household income, but this is for the popula total population, not just senior um, median income level. Um, this is, again, starting 40 years ago. And just provides good historical representation of median income. Um, and then their projection of median income for the next several years. See, for 2022, they're showing a 5% year-over-year -year increase from 2021. Um, average median income, approximately 72,000. And then they're projecting that to continue to grow um, over the next three years, 15%. Okay, so additionally, um, we look at, um, just like we look at the income levels for determining monthly fees, we look at home values when we start talking about looking at the entrance fee levels for communities. This chart's from the St. Louis Fed, and it reflects the change in home values over the past 20 years. Um, notably, um, I guess as we all know, since 2020 and the pandemic, there's been a rapid increase in home values. And you can see um, in 2022, there was a 19% increase in value from 2021. And then if you compare 22 to 2020, a 30% increase. And then just other notes, as I think as you see, you might expect this graph to have continue to risen, but you'll see that there was a dip in 2008 and 2009. But, um, so it lends the question, what's coming next? So this um, particular chart shows 30-year fixed mortgage rates. And again, this is actually over the last 50 years. Um, 2020 and 2021, 30-year mortgage rates were at historic lows, averaging around 3%. Um, I think that's no surprise for any of us here that we've all, we've all been hearing about that in the news. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out as you look at this chart, the, the highest bar on this chart, actually in 1982, mortgage rates were 16%. Mark Andrews, I found out that's the year he bought his first house. <laughs> so predictions right now, according to John Burns, are expecting uh, mortgage rates to end around 5% 5 per, 5 for the end of the year and then maybe around 55 and a half um, for the next coming years. Those probably didn't sound too bad compared to 16%, right, Mark? <laughs> so finally, um, due to the rising mortgage rates, um, limited supply, cooling demand, John Burns is forecasting that the number of existing home sale closings will lower back down to what they would consider normal levels, um, which would be the 10 years prior to the pandemic. So, and again, on this chart, you can kind of see the ramp up before 2008, 2009 that's on here as well. So um, another way to look at this, and this is a really busy chart. It almost um, probably looks more like a, an art painting or something. But John Burns rates uh, the top 50 housing markets over the past five years. And I know if you can see kind of in the middle, there's a kind of a red line that goes all the way up and down. That would be uh, March 2020. That would be during the pandemic. So to the left, you see a lot of yellow. That means they're normal. They were rating a lot of those markets in normal. Green and dark green would be very strong to strong markets, and then red and orange would be slower markets. So prior to the pandemic, you can see a lot more of the yellow. During the pandemic, they're rated a lot of the houses, a lot of the economy, of course, is slow. And then post that, um, not surprising to any of us here, of course, a lot of the markets have been rated as strong. And even in the course of me preparing this presentation, I started, um, as Mark mentioned, we start months in advance, so I started looking at the April data. And the April data, has changed significantly from the June data that we have in here right now. So um, in May, 90% of those markets were rated as strong. And then currently in June, they're reporting 61% of those housing markets as strong. And then 40% is normal. 
So while there's a lot of angst and a lot of panic right now, um, a lot of the predictions are that we're going back to what was considered normal. The real estate market is moderating and normalizing from kind of the hyperinflationary environment that we've been in. So what does that mean? Um, you know, we analyze a lot of this information and we follow a variety of sources, but how do we apply that then when we are planning for senior housing and for development? Um, so I'd like to kind of correlate that with the outlook at Windhaven. And um, the outlook at Windhaven is uh, Forefront Living's newest campus. And um, we've got Tim Mallon here, the CEO, and Steve Ailey and Scott Polzine. Um, the outlook at Windhaven um, is planned to be in Plano, Texas. It's located on an 18-acre site. Um, and that's just about 20 minutes north of Dallas. Uh, the community's plan to have under 183 independent living um, apartments and cottages, so 153 apartments and 30 cottages, 32 assisted living, and 24 memory support. Um, the outlook has multiple contract offerings planned and that we've been selling already in the market to provide choice and control. Um, and additionally, we're planning to offer a flexible service plan for their monthly service fee. So they'll have a basic um, package, but then they'll be able to alter it. If they're altering their dining program or if they're alter alternating um, what they're receiving in terms of house cleaning or maybe they're wanting to receive additional um, personal training, they'll be able to alter what they're getting in their monthly service fee package. And so I'd like to talk about how these changing market dynamics have impacted the outlook at Windhaven since we began the initial planning um, in early 2020. So this is the dot density map, and for anyone that's um, worked with Greystone, you're probably familiar with seeing the dot density map for the outlook. In the middle of this, you can see it. there's a yellow star, which indicates the location of the site. And then in the purple is what we consider the primary market area for the outlook. It's an eight zip code area in Plano, Texas. Um, and so we began doing uh, planning for this um, in summer of 2020, and prepared the development plan. And at the time, when we prepared the development plan, you'll see there's all these dots on here. And the dots represent senior households um, where the seniors are age 75 and older with income levels of 70,000 or more. And so at the time, when we prepared the initial development plan in 2020, we found there were 4,600 of senior households represented by the dots on here um, that were age and income qualified for our community. So then we went back and updated this information recently in 2022 and found that we now had seen 5,600 senior households age and income qualified in this market, representing a 21% increase, um, far exceeding the growth projections that we saw when we were doing the initial project planning. So additionally then, the other component that we've been talking about, the housing market. So John Burns has the Dallas housing market rated as strong. And um, so for the overall Dallas market, they've seen a 40% increase in median home prices since 2020 when we began the initial planning. And then more specifically, as we've looked at their primary market area in Plano, we've realized a 31% increase in the median list price. Um, John Burns is projecting a slight depreciation um, in home values in single digits over 2023 and 2024 that would still leave home values far above even where we've been in 2020 and 2021. So what's that mean? Now, all of these things we've been talking about, how, how, does, how do those market influences help us combat um, the tumultuous economic environment that we've been in? The Outlook um, began pre-finance activities in December of 2020 with um, a, bond, a band's financing, which is bond anticipation notes financing, whereby they secured the site, and we began pre-finance activities. At that time, um, when we start planning, of course, I'm going to go through each of these, um, these economic factors kind of separately, but we'll talk first about the interest rates. At the time, when we began the planning work, we always actually at Greystone um, try to plan in to be a little bit over the market when we plan for interest rates. So we usually allow about 1.5 to 2 basis points over market on interest rates. So fortunately, we've had cushion there um, as interest rates have fluctuated as you go out throughout the process. So we actually had a seven and a quarter interest rate. Um, Brandon's telling us he's going to get us in at probably 6% uh, when we go to permanent financing, right, Brandon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see where they are, but the point is that we, we plan conservatively, so, so we've got some room there and have had some room there as we've gone through the planning process. Secondly, construction costs. 
Um, you know, again, when the world was very different when we planned this project in December of 2020, um, we've had numerous price point checks um, as we've worked with um, our contractor and Bert Durr has been working with um, the contractor and we evaluate construction prices at several checkpoints, schematic design, design development, various time points. And so we've seen construction prices increase. And actually, since the time of the band's financing, we've experienced a 30% increase overall in the construction price. That's a lot. Um, so we've delved deeper into the market. We started looking at where we started on our entrance fees. Again, where we looked at the market in 2020, there's been 31% increase in home values. So there's room there where we needed to realign the project with what was going on in the market. Additionally, um, of course, labor market. We all know what's been going on in terms of that, and we've already touched on that this morning, but wage rates. So we've had to, we've had to revisit the planning process several times and gone back to looking at our assumptions. And um, most recently increased wage rates approximately 7.5%. And so then you have to look for other areas in the revenue envelope in order to maintain your profit margin. Um, without exceeding the market. And then supply chain issues, of course. Um, that's impacted some of our projects that are already in construction a little bit more. Fortunately for us, it's kind of given us a window into better planning as we get ready to start construction. So we've been able to account for longer lead times, um, and our Andrus is putting that into our construction timeline as we're starting to move forward. And, and additionally, Forefront's made the decision to actually start early site work, um, which we just started in June, two months in advance of when we anticipate the permanent financing so that they can get specifically kind of a jump start on ordering some of those uh, critical materials that have longer lead time so that we can maintain our project timeline. So we're very excited for the Forefront um, and Forefront Living and our marketing team. Uh, this graphic here shows that they just recently achieved 70% pre-sales, which is 128 pre-sales. And um, Christine Graber and Leslie Dominguez and Barbara Matamoros have been working with that marketing team, done a great job. They actually hit the pre-sales milestone three months earlier than we planned when we did the original band's financing. You think about that in this environment and everything that we've been going through in several waves of the pandemic, and we were able to achieve that milestone three months earlier. Um, so we're hoping to uh, finance the first week of August. And Ziegler, with the support of Forefront Living and with Greystone, we just issued the preliminary official statement, June 12th. And um, so we're, at, in that point, the band's holders will be um, paid out with the bond proceeds and the permanent financing. So we're looking forward to that and uh, moving forward in the next two months. So additional story, I'd like to talk to you for uh, real quick about Fleet Landing. And uh, many of you know Josh Ashby is here, CEO. Um, Greystone assisted Fleet Landing in 2016 with a strategic growth plan. The first initiative of that growth plan has been to focus on their, um, their original campus that's uh, located at Jacksonville and Atlantic Beach in Florida. It opened in 1985, and their first initiative as part of the strategic growth plan was an expansion and redevelopment of their existing campus. Um, so we've moved through that process, and they've actually just completed um, fill-up and achieved fill-up at nine month, in nine months, so ahead of plan and ahead of schedule. And during that construction process, though, um, one, of the, one of the decisions that um, Fleet Landing made was they had identified a site that they were interested in. And so during construction, they actually purchased that site and then land banked it, a bold decision, and then made the decision to wait to move forward on the second site until they achieved stabilization on their existing campus. So. The second site is in Ponte Vedra, Florida, and they're now proceeding with plans to move forward with this um, opportunity. It's a 31-acre site. It's located in one of the fastest growing master plan communities in Florida called Nocatee. It's known for its hiking and biking and golf cart trails, very desirable location. The site that they were able to secure is really right next to the town center there, um, and it has room for a second phase. Um, because of the successful expansion at Fleet Landing, they were actually able to fund the pre-finance costs with their own capital. Um, this gives them a unique advantage, too. Um, being a, a coastal, coastal area, they were actually able to be able to use the second campus as an evacuation location in the event of a hurricane for their original campus. So similarly, then, we noticed similar trends for Fleet Landing. Again, this is our dot density map, and you can see the yellow star here. Um, a little more blue water on this one than our Texas map. 
Um, but this shows a three-year difference. And so, um, again, just really remarkable um, changes in the number of age and income qualified seniors. In, 19, in 2019, we had 2,400 um, age and income qualified seniors at the 75,000 level. And now in 2022, almost 4,000. So very dramatic um, increases there. Uh, similarly to um, what we're seeing all across the country in Dallas as well, when you look at area home values, there's been a 31% increase in the median home price uh, since 2020 in Jacksonville market. And so we're looking forward to moving forward their plans and kind of moving forward for the next stage for fleet landing. So I guess at the end of the day, we all know we're in a dynamic economic environment. I um, wanted to just kind of share with you some of the resources that we follow and, and that we're kind of monitoring as we go through the planning process. And, um, you know, most of the research that we're seeing, hopefully we're looking at more of a normalization of where things have been out of this hyperinflationary environment. But um, we're going to continue to plan carefully with our conservative assumptions on interest rates, timeline, having the appropriate contingencies in the project, um, starting with having the right product and the right price based on that market and putting all of the, a lot of emphasis on understanding those, dem those analytical um, and demographics there. And then having a flexible plan that's able to balance those rising costs. So uh, with that, um, that concludes our portion of the presentation. I'd like to turn it over to Stuart Jackson and they'll start with um, Tim Mallet and Alan Currier. Okay.